Hey guys, and welcome to episode 39 of Give It The Beans. Now, it is a very special privilege um, and a little of a fangirl moment for me to introduce today's guest. It is the one and only Joe Bennett. Some of you will know him for his wicked beard. Some of you know from <laughs> the fact that he's just jacked. And some of you know from him his amazing information, the value he gives the industry for all things fitness related. So, Joe, welcome, my man. How are you today? I'm doing well, man. Thanks for having me on. Oh, mate, absolute privilege and a pleasure. Now, I'm sure there are some people listening who perhaps have been hiding under a rock and don't know who you are. So what I would like you to do is just give the listeners a little bit of information about what it is you do, your website, your coaching career to date, your journey within bodybuilding, and just, just everything in general. Yeah, sure. Um, I never really know how long to go on these, but... Oh, um, I, I, you feel free to elaborate. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I realize the value now because it's the same as uh, for me. I always think, like, obviously there's dozens and dozens of great coaches and athletes out there that I've learned from, I still like to learn from. So it's when I get to hear their little story as well, too. A lot of times stuff resonates with me, like, oh, yeah, I get that. Because, I mean, sometimes, obviously, a lot of times, hopefully someone obviously here is listening for the first time, so they're kind of coming at the end, and they're like, oh, look at this guy, and who knows what that perception is the first time. I always think the first time somebody sees one of my posts, like, sometimes the perception is like, what the hell is this guy writing all this shit for, and, like, what the hell is he talking about? And um, so I do. I like to get back and tell everybody, like, I started, I think, like, a whole bunch of people. Um, you know, I played sports my whole life growing up. Um, I kind of did a little where it was like my dad always worked out in the garage type deal. So there were sporadic times when I was 8, 10, 12, where I just, you know, bench pressed with him or random stuff. Um, but then I kind of remember sometimes around my uh, teens, so probably around 14, 14, 15, my brother had Arnold's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding, which is still to this day an epic book. And I just remember looking at that and being like, you know, holy shit, like, this is awesome. And uh, just like reading that thing cover to cover. And um, I first, the very first thing I started to do is like just started doing push ups and curls. So I literally would just every single night I would do push ups and curls. And I would like literally do a concentration curl. I'd buy like a dumbbell. I think I bought like a 10 or 15 pound dumbbell. And every night I would just do more curls until I could do 20. And then I'd buy a heavier dumbbell. And every night I'd try and do more push ups. I mean, there's some point in time I probably weighed 110 pounds, but I could do, you know, 100 push ups straight and I could curl a 30 pound dumbbell. So I was just, like literally just walking around all front delts and a bicep. And, um, but anyway, so I got obsessed with it from there to a, that was my first bit of obsession. Um, and then I actually had a track coach. I ran track in high school. Um, that said, Hey, we're going to go in the weight room now. And the joke is he gave us no direction. So I was just like, we were like every other like meathead, like ding dong guy, we would just bench press and do biceps pretty much. Oh, yeah. So even the, the joke would be, we'd like bench pressing and I'd be doing curls. And I'm like, Oh yeah, this is going to help me run like way better. <laughs> and, um, honestly at some point in time from there, like anybody that knows me, obviously I've got close friends from high school and acquaintances still from high school. Like I went like full on OCD, like it just something about it just clicked. I loved it. I mean, I'm, I'm the type of person I like. I like the process of things. I like things that are like going somewhere. I don't care how long it takes. And uh, so I literally, by my junior year, by the time I was 16, we had like a weightlifting class. So my schedule in my last two years of high school pretty much was I would work out during school and like a typical day would be I'd bench press. So I'd bench press for about 45 minutes was the time I had for that. And then after school, I'd work out at the school gym and I'd finish chest. So I'd do another hour, hour and a half of chest. <laughs> then from there, if I had at different times, I either would have sports, depending, I'd have to work around that. And then I had like a part-time job. So I'd go do my part-time job. And then I would go back to another gym that I paid for, like a membership. And I would finish uh, like push stuff then. So I do like shoulders and triceps. So for most of my high school career, I worked out three times a day. Um, and um, I didn't put on a whole lot of muscle for it because I didn't know anything. Like I didn't sleep a lot in high school. You know, you're getting up early. You know, it's just not a big sleeper. So I'd sleep six, seven hours a day. And then um, didn't eat. And I had no idea what I was eating. I was one of those people like I looked with my shirt off. I looked decent because I was just so lean that it was like now you could see like some muscle over my skeleton uh but I graduated high school like this height I'm like 5'10 5, 5'11 5, I graduated high school like 150 pounds um so like when I do the math right now is like could it possibly even look like I worked out at like 5'11 and 150 pounds um and then kind of fast forward and then in, in college university was the first time I actually like paid attention to nutrition I actually was sleeping 10 or 12 hours a night and I would say the most weight I've ever put on my life was that first eight months of school. I went from like 150 to about 185. And uh, all I was doing, I, was, I took my training down to twice a day. So that was like a comeback for me. So I did two a day, still like six days a week. Um, but I was legit eating 6,000 calories, sleeping 10 to 12 hours a night. It was like, I'll never have a perfect recovery storm like that ever again. And same thing, you know, my first semester too, I hardly had like, you know, I had 12, 15 credits a class, part-time job, but I had so much time on my hands. I was literally just a very relaxed, easygoing schedule. And then um, some point in time during college, I started, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was business, then I was pre-physical therapy. And then I actually ended up deciding my degree to be an exercise science 
Um, and so then I started working in the strength and conditioning program, the rec strength and conditioning program at the University of Florida. And that's when I first kind of got to get the gears turning of like, I, I like this. Like I got a job there basically just working in the gyms and helping with any programs and stuff that they had. Um, occasionally assisting with research within like the, like basically being like a participant in the research, um, you know, within the college. And um, that's the first time they actually started like a personal training program at the school there. So you could actually train like other college age people. Like I think now, like since I've gone back, like University of Florida has a pretty crazy personal training program there now, but it was kind of in an infancy then. And um, so then after that, I graduated, didn't know what I wanted to do, got into corporate wellness for about six months. That was kind of to finish my degree. It was like an internship. Um, and then I got offered a job in personal training. And I basically took it just because I needed money. <laughs> and I didn't really think, I honestly, my brain was like, you can't make a career as a personal trainer. Um, I honestly didn't really, you know, this is back in, you know, 2005 or six. Um, and it just, it wasn't as big then it was starting to get a lot bigger. Um, but again, obviously personal training kind of picked up late nineties was really becoming a decent profession. And uh, I got exposed luckily to a really good company at the time. And some really good people had an amazing personal training department. And so I kind of got obsessed from, I'd say 2006 to 2008, nine, which is like the business of personal training. And honestly, I'm like really competitive. So like the whole atmosphere of like, obviously I was inside, it was a corporate setting. I mean, so big box gyms. So you knew what other trainers in your club were doing. You knew what other clubs in your district were doing. You knew what like the company was doing. So I had like this passion for being a great trainer and then being competitive about it as well too. Um, and once I kind of like got really into the business side, at some point in time, stuff started to click with the education side again. Like I always wanted as much as I could in house. And then at one point in time, there was this one guy that was a great business mentor to me. who was also a brilliant trainer. And I kept trying to occupy his time and like try and have him help me out. And he was literally at the time when he was the president of personal training and then he eventually became president of the company. And I remember him literally saying like, man, like I hate to be a dick, but I don't have time for you, man. <laughs> like you need to go like do some of this education stuff on your own. And I literally remember thinking like, how did I not like think about this before? Yeah. Um, so I asked some people around, like I'd done like the kind of shit. I probably had two certifications that were just like, you know, take a test and send it in and here's your certification type deal. Um, and around that time, I think 2008, 2009, I actually started managing the training department. So from, you know, again, from 2006 to about 2015, 16, I worked in the big boxes. I managed training departments. Um, so I really was into the business side. And then around 2009, I think was 2009 or 10, I think I went and I took my first uh, certification from Charles Paulkin. So Charles Paulkin did a lot of continuing education. I spent a couple of years doing a lot of stuff that he did. So I did his PICP one and two. I've done the biosignature twice and then he turned it into bioprint and I took that again. So I took that course like three different times. I took some of his other stuff where he had some like kind of specialty ones. Um, and then at some point in time around then I got into RTS. Um, so those are the two. Uh, for years I did a Paul Quinn courses. I probably spent my most time with resistance training special courses. Um, I've done some of the intro stuff for M MAT, done some of the intro stuff for um, uh, functional anatomy seminars. I think there's some great stuff. Um, and so then like along that time, I kind of always had a passion for bodybuilding, you know, so I did a lot of working with normal clients. Then I started to work more towards people that were just about muscle building. And really I had a point in time, I had a client that was just like a middle-aged guy, um, that just got in great shape. So he's probably walking around year round at nine, 10% body fat, decent amount of muscle and successful guy. And he just said, Hey man, I've, I've got a kind of a bucket list. I want to do a show. And I'd never prepped anybody. And so I literally told him, I was like, man, I'm like, I don't, you know, I, you want me prepping you. I don't have any real experience at this. And he's, uh, he's literally like, well, he's like, one, I trust you. And he goes, but two, there's another stipulation. He's like, if I do it, I want you to do it with me. And I was like, man, I was like, I never actually thought about competing. Cause like, there's a whole lot of, I just don't think it's the healthiest thing on the planet. And I just kind of like, I like the whole process even more than that. I like the process more than getting on stage. And so I'd never thought about it. And, um, but literally I was like, well, you know what the hell I'll give it a go. And it was such a good experience for me because, again, I did this thing that I don't think anybody does anymore where, again, he was my first contest prep client and I told him that. Yeah. Um, so, again, I think that's a massive thing for trainers to people legitimately know what your experience is. And honestly, I wanted to say that, too, because I was nervous about, like, messing them up where it's like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I mean, I know how to get people extremely lean. And, uh, and like you should do when I was actually getting closer and trying to figure out this whole peak week magic, that was a big magical thing to me. Like I actually had some people that I had helped me with posing and helped with like the peak week and do all this kind of stuff. And, uh, I actually, obviously going through the process, I liked it even more. And I liked obviously just seeing what you're capable of taking your body to, to that stage level. And so he was really one of the first guys that actually spurred me to start working with more competitors. And, um, we both, it was a small local show, but we both did well in it. So I had a lot more people locally that wanted me to start working with them then. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, so 
I've been lucky to work with some awesome bodies, some awesome athletes. Um, I've competed, I think, six times myself. I joke I'm a wildly mediocre bodybuilder. Um, but it's one of those things where I think I'm, I'm genetically, I don't say that I have horrible genetics. I have decent structure, but I don't really put on muscle like at a crazy rate, which I think is half the reason I'm a decent coach. Um, but again, I wanted to go through that process. I started to like helping competitors so much. I felt like if I never went and actually competed, I wouldn't actually have the experience. The same as with someone obviously losing weight or going through. When you go through something that you want other people to go through, obviously it gives you one little extra thing that can help you probably connect with people, you know, on an emotional level and all the things they go through with all that. Um, and so then I've, you know, I spent some time uh, working with Ben Pikulski at MI40. I was there for two or three years. Uh, now for about three years, I've kind of been on my own. I have a great client that has a gym that he kind of built for himself and for me to train at. And um, so I do pretty much all my training out of there. Um, and now I'm doing a lot of training out of my garage, <laughs> which is also enjoyable in its own way as well, too. Um, but I think that's pretty much where I'm at. I think I, that's as, as short as I can keep it, which is not short at all. Yeah, well, uh, but kind of, kind of a foolish picture of everything. What, what I love is that for anyone listening who has followed you, they've never heard that detail of how much you've been around, how we experienced like, are. And anyone that's in the bodybuilding knows the, like, yeah. of Charles Polquin, Ben Pogolsky, and the fact that you've been with these guys. But to, to hear that, you know, to see what you, where you're at now with your website, you're working with guys like Ten Trump, it all started from someone just saying, do you want to do a show? And you kind of went, uh, okay, it, yeah. it's amazing that someone's put that idea on you and now you're at the level that you're at and you, the content that you produce is invaluable. Obviously, you have a private member site and we'll get to that later on the podcast, but you've now got this reputation as the hypertrophy coach and I think mm -hmm. that's absolutely amazing. That is the topic of today's podcast. So, Fred, I think that was a great insight, absolutely fantastic, but I'm going to quiz you now if that's okay because that's what the yes, please. listeners want. Those, they want those golden nuggets, right? So if anyone's wondering what the hell's hypertrophy mean, I'm going to ask you to give a basic explanation of you know, what is hypertrophy. If we were to think about the different mechanisms of hypertrophy, mm -hmm. you know, what they would exactly mean. And sorry, feel free to geek out, but if you want to make it come across in layman terms as well, but absolutely go for it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things, like you said, I mean, everything that I've um, – you know, cause I've been exposed to a lot. I've been exposed to a lot of brilliant people and a lot of people that have different types of brilliant that their brains work way better than mine for certain things. And so it's, I think that's massively important because I'll, I'll, on a side of a Paul Quinn story where I'm going to get into this kind of stuff is the first time I took a course taught by Charles Paul Quinn. I think literally after the first day I was depressed because if you ever got to hear him lecture in person and the way that he remembered things and could comprehend things and repeat things of like, literally he could, in an hour, he would cite 30 studies, the names of the doctors involved with the studies, and then he would interpret the data of it as well, too. So it actually obviously read and interpret everything. And so I literally remember sitting there and be like, man, this is, this is a coach. Like, I'm never going to be a coach. Like, I'm a fucking dumb dumb compared to this guy. What am I even doing here? And the funny thing is I remember talking to some people that were like, that was a very common thing coming out of Paul Quinn's stuff. It's like, man, like, I suck. And I remember thinking it's like, uh, you know, I kind of, I don't think that's a bad thing at some point in time to be so impressed by people and whatever they're very, very good at to take a moment of it's like, well, like I suck. But then it's like, well, what can I do now that I know that? And um, so I think it's a very good thing for coaches to actually, you know, there's so many different coaches out there and absolutely follow different coaches. and be like, Hey, this coach is great at this. This coach is great at this, but it's kind of cliche. You just kind of have to find the things that you're good at. Um, and then just obviously stay in, stay in your wheelhouse. And, um, and so my whole thing is, um, you know, I really think about obviously more my vast experience, you know, before is not necessarily understanding all the mechanisms of this and that I'm not actually a huge physiology guy. I think there's a difference between physiology and I'm more concerned myself kind of a mechanics guy. And the reason I say all that is because for me, I always like, I got to a point where I'm like, you know, I'm exposed to all this knowledge and all this stuff. And the, the thing I just sifted through is like, how does this actually translate to gym decisions? Because at the end of the day, as a coach, as a trainer, and where I've actually had the most experience is actually working with bodies in person. You know, so that's my whole thing where, if, okay, well, what is hypertrophy? How do we, you know, hypertrophy muscles and make them bigger? Um, you know, that's the things that I want to understand, again, are what actually comes down to a gym decision. And occasionally I'll nerd out with some other stuff, but I can, I'm capable of leaving things like, well, maybe this is this, or maybe that's that, or maybe this is this proposed mechanism or whatever. Um, so for simplicity purposes, um, you know, hypertrophy is just adding more tissue. And so again, you'll have people, is it like the actual contractile tissue? Is it the volume, everything encased, obviously, with whatever makes a muscle or whatever? Um, you know, so again, I'm trying to put on tissue, whatever the hell that means. And, um, and again, the simple version is you can tell when someone's put on muscle or hasn't put on muscle or put on lean muscle. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm really just tra uh, training for, first and foremost, like a physical appearance. 
Um, and then obviously you can have, you know, function and strength and things come along with that just to a certain degree. Um, and I think that I keep all of my focus is the main driver for hypertrophy. And depending on who you listen to and who you talk to, everything else could still stem from this and could be correlational and not causational, but is force. Um, so again, I look at, obviously we have, you know, what is your bone to bone pool? Like what is a muscle? If I look at my bicep and I take it out of my body to some degree, I need that to produce as much force as it can. And then again, for just how we train over a contractile range. So it might look like a curl, but if I'm just looking at the muscle doing this outside of my body. Um, and so it seems to be the best that it's, you know, we want things moving. So again, maybe isometrics work, whatever they still produce force, but it seems like concentric eccentrics work. And then we want as much force production, you know, relative to where someone's at, you know, over that given exercise. And then from there, I think everything else is kind of secondary. So people are like, okay, well, if I'm doing that, that determines kind of exercise selection, that determines form, that determines the load that I'm using. And then once you establish all that, then we can kind of start looking at some other stuff, like how much volume am I doing more straight sets or supersets or giant sets? Um, and then kind of like we were, um, you know, mentioned beforehand, is it, is it then is there this whole metabolic thing or what are the different pathways? And the funny thing is when I listen to other smart people and we actually kind of analyze some research, you could make a pretty strong argument that, you know, in and of itself, you know, metabolic byproducts and metabolites and all that stuff may or may not actually lead to hypertrophy pathways. That might just be stuff that happens. We observe it happens still as a result of force production. Because to my understanding, there's no actual studies that exclude force production and show hypertrophy. And I've actually seen some stuff or I've read, briefly overviewed some stuff where they talk about, hey, here's how we produce these metabolites minus any type of contraction, minus any type of force production. And they haven't been able to show any hypertrophy occurring from that, which is an interesting thing because that's not an easy thing to basically show or do in a study. Uh, so anyway, if I have a niche and I'm kind of looking at something, it's like, okay, well, we're going to do this thing. You know, I want to know what is the muscle basic anatomy, where's its origin insertion, what type of concentric eccentric can it produce? What is it capable of producing? Like how much force can it produce over that given range of motion? Um, and I want to maximize that because at, at the end of the day, it's an adaptive process. So again, if whatever you're capable of doing, I want to put you very close. And again, depending on your level, do you have to go, you know, completely to your capacity? Do you have to do whatever close to it? You have to be close to capacity and something has to progress over time, you know, for you to continue to have that adaptive response. So. Um, I think I answered a question in there somewhere. <laughs> I certainly did. I liked your point at the end about how you said we need to be close to capacity. I mean, like, one thing we need to do is we need to give it the beans, right? That's what I would say. What the whole name of the podcast is that yeah. I personally love training to failure or pretty close. Not yeah. to say that everybody will, but the fact that you've said that, that force is the main driver or how much mm -hmm. force we can produce is the main driver yeah. of muscle adaptation is the most layman's terms that you could ever come across in regards to explaining that. So absolutely, yeah. man, what I love is your whole approach to explaining stuff. I think it comes across very, very well, whereas a lot of the time, unless you have studied physiology at university, when you sit and listen to someone that is coming across and given a say, physiological response, sometimes you're kind of like, oh. yeah, you know, <laughs> but what, what, how you explain it, you can relate to that and resonate with that 100%. Now, I think what would be quite good is if we were to think about the current situation scenario, we're, we're all locked down. There's a lot of people training as they are from your garage. And I've, I've seen some of your setups, by the way, you've got a good setup. Yeah. Garage. So, you know, you're still growing, but some people are probably thinking, well, you know, financially I've, I've not got the funds to go buy some equipment or I've got some and, there's not a lot of weight. Maybe I've got lighter dumbbells, I've got mm. medium weight plates, maybe they've got 15 pound weight plates and a barbell or something. Yeah. So if we're thinking, right, force is the main driver. Someone out there is thinking, right, does that just mean I want to get my barbell and do as many curls as much as I can? Yeah. Or, or would you in that sense, so we're speaking about you know, adapting a program mm. for still trying to get an adaptive response or muscle yeah. hypertrophy? What would your suggestions be? Would we necessarily focus more on, you know, or how would, rather than me say, I'll, I'll let you, how would you adapt any sort of programming? Yeah. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, I think the big thing that people miss, and especially in our entire industry and in the entire world, is just to take the moment of saying, okay, you know, what do I have at hand, which is the same now as it is when you have a gym? What do I have at hand? You know, what am I willing to invest? Um, so, again, even, this is the difference between it's like when I talk very specific about like really nerd stuff sometimes to so get out of the context of that. It's like, does that matter for Mrs. Jones or someone that just is a casual <laughs> lifter? It's like, 
Of course not. Like who gives a shit if she's got the perfect bicep exercise? Mrs. Jones should have a curl randomly in her program once a week or something, you know? Um, so, but the same as everybody is not everyone's goal is always to put on as much muscle as possible. And I understand that as much as everyone. Um, again, I'm, I'm kind of in a very more normal part of my life where I may or may not ever compete again. And I just want to look good. I want to feel good. All those things that, you know, again, when I started, I wanted to get bigger, but also and it's like, man, like I love, like you said, I love training. I love the feeling of hard training. Like, and I honestly am aware now that I need that more than I actually need a specific physical response. Um, you know, so I get this question where it's like, I think some people ask some of these questions and I just want people to take a second of thinking about like, why are you actually asking this question? Um, because sometimes I think they know the answer or they're just looking for an excuse. And all I mean by that is I kind of, I just, I feel the similarity when people ask me like, I'm natural, like how far can I take my physique? And I'm like, what is the purpose of asking that question? Because at the end of the day, this journey of training is you wake up this morning and then you're going to go make some decisions that either support it or don't support it. You asking how far can I make it naturally is like, you know, if you're, I, I think most people ask that to just place a limiting belief on themselves where one, it's like, well, you know, I'm natural. And I read somewhere in a study that you can only put on six pounds of lean tissue and it, you know, and then it, you know, it gets lower and lower from there. And it's like, well, that's that. And I'm like, well, why the hell would you want to have that thought process anyway? Or some people just want an out. Well, it's like, well, I can't get big without drugs. So I might as well just start taking drugs. And I'm like, you know, I mean, so at, at the end of the day, it's like if, if someone's capable, like now I like that kind of stuff. I like to sit back and observe the entire population that I've worked with or that I've seen. And then when I take everything into the equation of obviously genetics and there's drugs and there's training age and it's neat to see like, what is someone capable of? What are they not capable of? If you want to just study that, like you're literally in university and just talking about some, you know, subject, Oh, this is neat. Oh, uh, whatever. That's fine. But if I don't think a lot of people are asking it for that question, where I'm going with this, hopefully is the same with training at home where some of it's, um, it, depending on who it is, just manage your expectation because I'll get some people where it's like, Oh, you know, I've got, I've got this little pink tube. Can I still put on muscle? And I was like, well, before this, did you pay for a gym membership? Did you leave your house or did you go work out with a pink tube? And like, Oh, well, I, you know, I pay for a gym membership. And like, were you doing all the things because you think that's the best way to put on muscle or because you could have done it with a pink tube and you just like to pay someone a monthly membership, have to drive an hour out of your way every day and hang around with a bunch of stinky, annoying people. Um, so odds are before all this happened, people were attempting to make their best decisions to put on muscle. And if you're in a situation where it's drastically different, I mean, I don't want to tell people that like, Santa Claus isn't real, but it's like, you're probably going to lose muscle. You know, if you're, I, I joke, you get these people that they're, you know, they're doing RDLs with six plates aside and now you got pink stuff, you know, it's like, well, yeah, we can still focus on control. We can focus on tension. We can focus on trying to find fatigue points in different rep ranges. But at some time before all of this starts, I think some people just be like, you don't need to ask me, can I, can I maintain muscle? Can I put on muscle? I don't know. Um, and again, the further you are from what you were doing, the answer is probably no. And then just depending on, for lack of a better word, training age and genetics, some people will hold on to tissue better than anyone else. Um, so I think most people would benefit from just saying, okay, what do I have at hand and what can I actually accomplish now? And most people, if it's drastically less than what they were doing before, what they can accomplish is mentally not feeling like they're going to go insane. So you can absolutely train hard with just body weight. You can train hard with body weight and a pink band. You can train hard with a body weight, a pink band, and a four-pound dumbbell. Um, so depending on what you've got, anyone can train hard. Anyone can find a mental relief. Um, aside from that, everywhere in between the six-plate RDL, you know, and the body weight or a pink band, it just depends. You know, I would focus on, you know, if, if let's say hypothetically you have a 50-pound dumbbell or whatever, you have two 50-pound dumbbells. I mean, technically, if that's not too far off from what you were chest pressing before, maybe ideally you were doing 68 rep range. Well, now I could make the argument that if you're doing 20 reps and that's your max now with your 50 pound dumbbells and over these next few weeks or months or however long it is, you progress to 21, 22, 23, you know, so I think because of some things that seem to probably lead to hypertrophy as well too, you can maybe work in rep ranges you haven't before. You can maybe spend more time in exercises where force demands are higher um, and you could still maybe do a better job of holding on to tissue. And then some people might be able to put on tissue along the way. Um, so again, it's just, um, I don't think people are really taking a minute. Because so, again, if you have this, if your whole goal is, good God, can I hold on to muscle? And that's your thought process the whole time. Then you're just going to be stressed and sad and upset this entire time until you get back into the gym, right? Because your expectations, oh, dear God, I hope to put on muscle. Where if it was just like, well, I might not be able to put on muscle now. I might lose a little bit of muscle, but I can still feel good. And like you said, it might be an opportunity of time to just focus on some other stuff. Can I fix stuff? Can I recover better? 
can I be in a position where as soon as this is done, I can get back to where I was quickly and potentially propel myself to somewhere I wasn't where I wasn't before quicker from there as well too. Um, so, you know, and then if people are looking for specifics, I've given this a couple of times for upper body, I don't sell them. So again, I, I should sell them because I would have made a lot of money. But, uh, you know, if you're looking for pieces of equipment, you know, for cheap bands are a great place to start. Then from there, I'd probably go right into rings. I mean, it's the thing that I've kind of actually just having some at the house. I've had some for a while. And then think about basically gymnastics rings. Um, you know, just it's maybe not what you would normally do. But from a whole upper body standpoint, I don't think there's a person under the sun that can't at least maintain, if not put on a significant amount of muscle with just rings. Uh, because anyone that's ever done ring pull-ups or ring dips, uh, most people can't do 20. So if you do, can't do 20 now and you can get to do 20 of either, something's going to be bigger. If you have something that you can attach to your body and make a joke of a weight, you know, a backpack with stuff on, have a small child hanging around your waist, and you go from the point of, oh, I can only do five pull-ups on rings to by the end of this, you can do 20 pull-ups on rings with a small child around your waist, something's going to be bigger. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the, I understand that myself included, everyone's in kind of a stressful, a very stressful situation, some more than others. You know, people like certainty, people like schedules, whether they think they do or not. And we don't have that. So I think if people could just take, you know, some deep breaths, what do I have? What can I do? And, um, and just kind of make peace with it and move forward. And then the reality is, again, I, you know, I hate that there's not to speak to the situation too much. Um, but, you know, if we look back over the course of human history, I mean, the reason this is so tough on a lot of us is because we're so spoiled. I mean, most of us are first world. Most of us live in extreme, extreme comfort. I mean, statistically, you look at what level of um, luxury you're in if you have a car and you have air conditioning relative to the rest of the world. And half of us, we still have that. We still have food. We still have water. We're still living in a sanitary place. And now we've just lost all of our extra cushy stuff where it's like, I like to go out and do this. I like to have that. And I like to have that. And again, I'm not preaching. I'm the exact same way. Like I'm, I'm a creature of habit. Um, but when we kind of look at all that kind of stuff, if everyone could just kind of take like a, you know, a deep breath and here's what I've got, here's what I can get done. Um, in the grander scheme of things, we're going to look back in a matter of time. And if you're really into this and it's really your thing, I mean, it's not going to make a big difference at all. I mean, the reality, it's just basically a, a, a moderate term, you know, disruption of our very comfortable lives, basically. What I love and everything that you said there was sort of just like with working with what you've got, because there's been a lot of clients that literally I programmed in a backpack, barbecue, like backpack split squat, because they said, Vaughn, I've got nothing. I'm like, you got some like empty yeah. like gallon bottles of water we can fill up, put in a backpack. And um, I liked your comment about the rings. I personally couldn't do one, having put on 30 pounds since finishing practice mm. four weeks ago. So yeah. <laughs> that is a very good suggestion. Yeah. I think one thing that I've preached a lot and I wanted to really ask you about as well was, I think, especially maybe perhaps over here in the UK, um, something I never really focused on and I should have done years ago was tempo and mechanical tension, right? And I think that yeah. a lot of the lighter lighter weights or lighter load that I've that, that my clients have got or people across the fitness industry have got, mm. now would be a, a better time more than anything to focus on actually like using the muscle that does the movement sure. or you yeah. know, perhaps spending a bit more time underneath that load. So how, how important do you think that, or perhaps mechanical tension is missed or before the lockdown was, was missed in regards to someone getting as jacked as can be? Is, is it about force or is it about how we move along with that force? Yeah. I, mean, I guess the answer is it's both. And it's funny. It's like myself included, you know, things tend to kind of go in like cycles of like, um, you know, I'll ma I've made the joke using myself as the butt of the joke. It's basically if you take my stuff out of contest, you know, I made the thing the joke is the team pink dumbbell. You just squeeze stuff perceivably really hard and that puts on muscle. Um, and then you make a joke of um, people that see Jordan Peters stuff. You know, I'm good friends with Jordan Peters. I think he's an amazing coach. And you have some people that see his stuff that it's just like, I'm just going to keep putting plates on the bar. And eventually if I go from doing, you know, one plate aside to eight plates aside, I'm going to be huge. And the reality is obviously both of those things hold degrees of truth. And I think anyone that's really trying to progress themselves as far as possible, there's always going to be, when you start, either kind of works. You know, if you've never thought about this mind-muscle connection form thing and you get a pink dumbbell and you do good form, you can get bigger. And at the beginning, you just start to slap weight on the bar, you get bigger. But anyone that gets further and further along those journeys, you know, those points essentially start to converge and it's always a struggle back and forth. So if I make the joke, if it's, you want to look at those things as black and white, I say results occur in the gray. And um, so I think it's, it's good because I've done both times. I've gotten times where I'm like, man, am I too form focused? And I use this example of someone's trying to squeeze their pink dumbbell and they're doing it just totally by perception. 
Like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, today I'm squeezing eight out of 10. Oh, I'm going to squeeze nine out of 10. Oh, I'm squeezing 9.1 out of 10. Nine po- like, are you progressively trying to squeeze harder every single time? And at which point in time, it's like, well, if you've got a pink dumbbell and you know that someone else can do the same exercise with 50 pounds, where's your bigger, biggest opportunity of improvement? Moving from a 9.1 to a 9.2 on the squeezy scale? Or are you actually trying to start to put more weight on the bar? And, uh, and those are the extreme examples to obviously hopefully make an extreme point. Um, but yeah, so this is a great opportunity where I do the same stuff. I think about stuff all the time. I mean, when I think about bodybuilding in the first place, I think about so many great anecdotal examples of just like, you know, Arnold and in his book, I mean, bodybuilders back in the day, they talk so much about like visualization. So again, even aside from just the actual mechanically putting yourself in the right positions, there absolutely is something too. I think the best way is you're just trying to make something as hard as possible on yourself. You know, so again, it's whether it's actually visualization, I think helps. You know, this perception of making it hard helps, but people that get it, they, they kind of get it. And the anecdotal story I just thought about the other day I hadn't heard in a while was because, again, I think probably the past in the Franco Colombo, and again, it was in a book or something. It could have been completely made up. I don't really care. But basically him uh, in the gym curling a 40-pound dumbbell and some guy coming up and saying, hey, I, I curl 40s too. And, you know, why do your arms look like that? And his thing is like, well, my 40s are heavier than your 40s. And the whole point of this little, the little story was that he was making the 40 pounds heavier. You can make 40 pounds you know, however you can make 40 pounds or you can make 40 pounds as hard as possible. And uh, so those are things I kind of go in cycles as well too, where sometimes it's like, man, you know, you've got to, there's no, people ask me, it's like, you know, they want to have the one or the other. Do I do good things with good form or do things with as much weight as possible? And when you say both people get pissed off because both is hard, right? It's like, well, how do I do it? You know, I've got to cheat a little bit, this and that. And the reality is when you, again, and JP talks about this all the time, which is great. If you're, it doesn't matter if you're enhanced, if you're natural, obviously the biggest difference is the pace at which things occur. I mean, everybody wants to sum up. What's the difference is like, well, if you're enhanced, you know, you're going to be more androgenic and more anabolic. So you might be able to actually perceivably lift a little bit more relative than someone else, but more than anything else, because you're anabolic, the process just happens faster. Everyone should just leave it at that. And so I think nothing else changes a whole lot. I mean, I've changed so many, you know, middle-aged females that are hormonally in horrible spots that still just progressive overload in some capacity works. You know, we establish this baseline of form and then we progress them. And lo and behold, hormonally, they're in a horrible spot. They're females and they can still progress and put on tissue just fine, just at a slower rate. Um, so anyway, I mean, it kind of talks about where I think a lot of people that aren't progressing when they really can't figure it out, they're probably just, you know, they actually lack intensity. They actually lack willing to go somewhere in the gym, but then they also lack recovery because I mean, I've been there personally. I mean, I honestly know like lots of times I'm just realistic. I can maintain with what I'm doing now. If I'm not a hundred percent, even with me, if I'm 90% with my diet right now, I can't progress. I'm at a point where I've been training long enough where I have to be 100%. And there's very rare times now that I honestly feel like being 100% with my diet. And then I had long periods of time with having three kids that are all under the age of six is I wasn't getting a whole lot of sleep. you know. So it's like it's, people don't want to take a whole lot of time to just be realistic with those things. Uh, so to answer your question after 20 minutes, yeah, I think it's people could take advantage of this time if you don't have load. You know, just again, there's a whole bunch. You can listen to me talk about nerd stuff and mechanically, this is the hardest position. People inherently know sometimes they're just avoiding it already. Like, where's a squat hard? Can I go in the bottom of a squat and spend more time there? Or can I go in the bottom of the squat and just sit, you know, my hamstring on my calf and let tension off? So most people have this inherent knowledge of what, regardless of what mechanics are making it that reason, where exercises are hard, where they normally cheat, you know, where they're normally not spending time or they're avoiding. So yeah, that could be a simple thing. And now again, it's one of those things for sure someone everyone that will help hold tissue better some people will still lose tissue some people it might be enough for them to hold on to it but anybody if you're just kind of refreshing yourself on this whole form on this whole just make it as hard as possible on myself thing when you come out the other side and you've got access to all your weights again i mean doesn't it make sense that if oh here's the same thing i was doing before with a similar weight and now i feel it better i'm spending more time where it's hard um and that's the thing i always joke as well too like the one of the most the strongest correlation i find with people that have strong body parts and lagging body parts is not always the load they use or whatever it is. It's always feel. That's a hundred percent correlation. Where someone comes to me and they say, "Man, I've got." That's what I get. I get people that have lagging body parts. Nobody, you know, like um, Phil Heath, never has you know knocked on my door and said, "Hey, man, can you help me with my arms?" Like nobody does that. Nobody has a strong body part and asks somebody else for help. They have a bad body part and they come and they say, "Hey, man, I can't grow this." And so one of the first questions is, "Okay, I'm like, well, what's your best body part?" It's chest. And I'm like, okay, well, how do you feel your chest when you train? Like, what's your best? Oh, every, every exercise is my best exercise. I can feel it all from start to finish, stretch to squeeze, incline, lower, it all works. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm like, well, what's your worst body part? Uh, you know, it's lats. I'm like, well, how, how do you feel your lats? And I'm like, wow, well, you know, I don't, I don't feel them very good. I don't feel them on a whole lot of stuff where I have to get it like just right. And if there's like a slight breeze and I go out of plane, I can't feel my lat anymore. 
And so again, if, if you look at that, that, that conversation is the same with everyone. So just for that reason alone, this is where it's like, oh, just more weight on the bar, we'll do stuff. It's like, no, I've seen people do eight plates on a hack squat and have big adductors and shit quads. I've seen people row four or five plates on something and have no lats. Um, so again, there is those two things are not exclusive and they never can be if you want to take your body as far as possible. And I would argue, again, the biggest thing, there's a correlation with lagging body parts before anything to do with load, again, is that whole feel thing. And again, how much time you want to spend working on that or improving it, I don't know, individual dependent, but it just have to recognize that both those things exist. And that's the prerequisite really before you get into load is can I actually feel this muscle through any given range of motion before you start to think like this whole exercise thing. Yeah. And I think, dude, like you answered that and went above and beyond, like in the thing, just showing the importance to any sort of potential competitor out there that wants to get into bodybuilding and do it over the years is that if you nail feel now, it'll stand mm -hmm. you instead for the future. But as long as you're willing to fucking go to those dark places and be willing to try and put eight places, yeah. but still feel it, you're probably going to get jack quads by the end of it. So totally yeah. For anyone listening mm -hmm. as well, you know, JP is a huge influence in the UK in regards to bodybuilding. And I remember when he switched from doing like, he was doing like, I'll, I guess this will try and translate in pounds. He was doing like 60 or 70 pound like dumbbell lateral raises. And then there was yeah. like one week when he switched over to doing like a crucifix cable cuff lateral raise. Mm -hmm. and, and that came from yourself. And see now, it is one of the most like, I would say popular like prescribed exercises. You look at anyone's Instagram that's you know decent yeah. in the UK. All their clients are doing it. All my clients do it. So mm. thank you for doing right. to do that. And then mm. us it, it come across the UK. So anyone listening will just know that you know that's a huge influence that you've had on you know JP and then thus the UK body one. So I guess I'm saying thank you from from all. Sweet. Um, now you made a really good point um, about when your recovery is not on point and you mentioned that when you're not sleeping great and, and whatnot that, you know, you can't progress hundred percent. And there's people out there that are probably in the same boat. They're thinking, well, I need to be hundred percent on my diet, my sleep, this and the next thing. And I've not got a lot of weight, so I'm just going to do more. And they're thinking mm -hmm. I'll, I'll train an extra day. I'll, I'll do an extra, you know, I'll do an extra 10 sets across the week for that body part. So I yeah. guess you could say that like, do you believe that they could in fact, be somewhat overtraining right now with even the quote unquote lighter loads or you know if anyone's out there is thinking that you know is is more better right now or should it be very much similar yeah i mean it's uh again it's got to go back well what's the expectation of this and there's um so some of it now it's one of those things where again if you know you ask me i think um running 26 miles is too much <laughs> <You know>, people <laughs> like running marathons um, so the joke is now, I mean, honestly, and the whole reason I give that little setup is there's someone now that's just trying to not like lose their damn mind and they're bored. Um, and so again, if it's like, I mean, people are doing stuff they haven't done. I've literally seen so many people like, man, I'm going to go for a jog. And it's like, well, what are you going for a jog for? I mean, if, obviously if I would say that's not an activity that in and of itself is great for muscle building, but it's just because we've got time on our hands and we're just trying to be physical as opposed to sit on the couch and do nothing. You know, so some of it is like, I wouldn't ever say, even if someone technically is overtraining, it's, if it's keeping their sanity, have at it. I think that's the little thing that people have to do. Again, the, to go back to the example, running a marathon is not healthy, period. In no sh way, shape, or form. Orthopedically, it's not healthy. I would argue from the stress it places on your body, it's not healthy either. But that being said, I completely understand why people run marathons. They have this expectation of just seeing what they're physically capable of doing. Same as competing. Competing for whether you're natural or not natural, whatever. Getting on stage is not a healthy thing as far as what's going to make you live longer. Um, so it's one of those things where um, it just depends on where someone's at. And uh, people need to be realistic with their recovery as well now too because, again, you know, we look at food's a big part, so everyone should be okay with food now. Sleep's a big part. They should be okay. But equally big, if not more, sometimes is stress. Um, and so that's the thing, you know, stress, and I'm not an expert on everything that entails stress from the physical response and all that kind of stuff, but realizing that stress is not always perceivable. Um, there could be just basically low levels of stress occurring at all different times. And those things can put your body in a poor place for recovery as well, too. And to the point, sometimes I've, I've worked with enough people where that I've seen, unfortunately, a lot of life events happen with different clients from, you know, death in the family to loss of a job to big, any type of big shift in life. And you, you will see people's bodies, like especially I've worked with competitors, where you know they're doing the exact same things and their bodies can just change for the worse overnight. You know? And some people obviously, everybody can use anything as an excuse, but it's such a real thing as well too. So that'd be the thing now for anybody. 
is just be aware. There's some people obviously that maybe they're not stressed at all. They're just kind of chilling and sleeping and eating, in which case, if you want to do a little bit more, you know, why not? Um, but if more wouldn't have done the job before, I don't think it'll do the job now, you know, for the most part. Um, so, cause that's a tough argument I have with people is cause I've messed around with that a little bit. The times when my recovery has been perfect. Can I definitively say, you know, two sets or, and, and if I compare them, uh, here's my two sets I normally do or now my recovery is perfect. And now should I do three sets? Will I actually get more or will they both have just produced the same level of results? So I think the notion, if we're just talking pure muscle building, of the least amount of stimulus to produce the maximal result is where most people should try and stay. There is this notion, again, obviously there's a volume component to hypertrophy. You know, there is obviously that's, that's the whole reason one rep maxes don't work is obviously volume starts first with repetitions within a set. And then it seems like some people respond better than just to one to maybe two sets or depending on how you're doing two or maybe three. Um, I don't know where the cap on that ends. I know that personally from what I've seen is you just can't keep driving hypertrophy. It's depending on the individual that runs out pretty fast. Um, so it's one of those things now, again, if the idea is I, I have less load and I have all this less stuff and I hit, can't hit these failure points, could I just do more and anticipate putting on more muscle? I don't think that's the case. Um, I just think someone's probably more likely just to turn it into something else as opposed to maybe overtraining. Um, because again, maybe just, you're just turning into an endurance athlete. If you just want to do a bunch of random shit off throughout the day, then you might just be working in some different energies. I mean, that's the people that are doing all body weight circuits and stuff now. And again, I'm not saying that's bad. But again, if a lot of people are advertising, and I haven't seen a whole lot of people. I mean, some people like to make fun of everybody. Oh, look at this person doing this stuff and people lifting up their couches. Like, who cares? If someone's just saying, hey, I just figured out I could lift up my couch, as long as they're not selling the couch program and saying that you're going to put on muscle with it. Um, you know, that's the thing as well, too. You see, and that, that exists all the time in the industry. You see a bunch of people. And if my whole thing, if someone's advertising, here's what I do, and someone wants to watch that or emulate it or even pay for it, as long as that's how it's advertised, kudos to them. You know, if someone's saying, oh, I'm in, an expert and these are my credentials and I'm qualified and ba it's based on what they're doing themselves and they're guaranteeing the same response for other people, then that might be a little, you know, unprofessional or whatever. But, um, yeah, so it's one of those things where it's, again, I, I don't, I wouldn't think more would be the answer now to actually hope to put on more muscle. Um, but again, it just depends on why you would or wouldn't want to do more. And again, all these conversations are geared towards muscle building, kind of like you were saying, depending on your clients and the, the clients you're talking to now, I mean, that's why I say these, especially with normal people, you have to have those conversations of why people work out in the first place. Most normal people, they may eventually get to a point where they get some of like the mental benefits of it, like this, that because you could argue training is a type of stress we're supposed to be exposed to and it causes all these positive benefits. And a lot of people, even if they're normal, begin to recognize that and they like that and they need that. But some normal people, they never get to that point. They just always hate it. Like being honest, they just hate the gym. They hate coming to the gym. But they're grownups and they understand the same as they might not enjoy brushing their teeth. It's good for them. And um, so now is the point where you get people where it's like, oh, man, I don't have this. I don't have that. And it's you could have clients, some people using that as an excuse to basically do nothing. And I would say if you've had the right conversations in the first place, your clients should give two shits what they're doing. I mean, if you're general, just general fitness, general weight loss, there is nothing right now taking away from your ability to just continue to lose weight, to stay fit, to maintain a decent amount of tissue, to have the metabolic benefits of using resistance training. Um, and again, with the big exception of, I just say that with the assumption that there are some people that have lost their jobs. And so again, obviously, if, if you've lost your job and you're a trainer and you're trying to get that person to stick with you right now, I mean, have some empathy, you know, I mean, just provide whatever assistance you can. Maybe you can't be with them doing three times a week video workouts or whatever you're doing. Um, but again, so if, as long as you recognize first and foremost that people are people and you're trying to help them, again, if someone's a single mom and now they still are trying to do a job and all of a sudden they've got three kids to take care of and they're trying to do all, like, you know, again, if they want, if they're still looking for you for a solution to help with, with their workouts or whatever, and just give them some different tools and give them some support, have at it. But there are some people obviously that aren't in great spots now. But again, aside from any, you know, big health issues or emotional issues or financial issues, if you're general population now, if you're just trying to stay fit, if you want to be losing body weight. In my opinion, there's no reason you can't continue to do that right now. I love that you kept referring to the average Joe. I think it was great, right? Because there'll be a lot of competitors listening to this, but there will also be a lot of average Joes. So the yeah. fact that you've done that is incredible. And I would completely agree with you in the sense of, I put a post the other day that was just thanking the coaches in the industry right now that are keeping the industry afloat from giving out free workouts on their YouTube, mm. their you know the mm. tutorials or whatnot. Um, because as you said, it is unfortunate, you know, like, Personally, I dropped like, you know, $2,000, $2, I suppose, for gym equipment to put in my shape yeah. to still train. Not everyone can do that. But I think that 
even though for everyone it improves their mental health, for a lot of bodybuilders out there, like the gym is more than just getting fucking jacked. It's that place yeah. that you said of it's our alone time. It's the two hours a day or the two hours every other day, which we have world off headphones on. It's just us. So I've just tried to stress to people as you, you've done, and I love that you've said this whole podcast to just keep doing something. Even if we yeah. can't gain tissue, even if we feel like we might lose a little bit of tissue, um, yeah. just being able to, to, to put some weight on a barbell and just move a little bit of weight is going to do us the world of good for up here. So I think that's cool. Sure. Now, I think that you know we've spoken a little bit about hypertrophy in general and training, but managing recovery is something that you know should be we should place a huge emphasis on sort of year round. And there's probably a lot mm-hmm. of athletes right now um, where their routine slightly skewed, or maybe their circadian rhythms off, or they're going to bed late, or they're eating junk because they're like, oh, suck, you know, sack it off. I'm just going to do this after lockdown. But yeah. if there's any sort of key principles right now that that athletes should look at, or bodybuilders, sorry, should look at and yeah. think that. Perhaps if they instill now that they could take like into post lockdown in this sort of quest to gain yeah. the issue thereafter. What would be, let's say, the three fundamental things that you would focus on right now? Yeah, I mean, so there's a kind of a broad umbrella, um, but I, I think a lot of um, like you said, if a bodybuilder is really, really serious about it, like they're trying to make and whether you're serious trying to make a living out of it or you're serious because it's your only hobby and you want to take it as far as possible. And again, because I think there's someone out there that even though they're not going to be Mr. Olympia, they could put just as much stock and take it just as seriously, if not more serious than some bodybuilders. And again, I'm not the person to say that's right or wrong. But if it's that important to you, some people, what they say and what they do don't always line up. And that's massive in the bodybuilding world. Because right now in the bodybuilding world, and it's always been this way, is people like to advertise um, you know, the hardest worker in the room shit, the stuff that looks cool. I'm grinding, I'm doing this, you know, and it's amazing to me. There's still people in the bodybuilding world that will like hashtag like team, no sleep. And I'm like, <laughs> it's not fucking bodybuilding. If you're advertising, like I, I get it from like, I'm not going to get into life stuff. You know, if there's someone, if you're starting a business and there's periods of time in your life where you're, you know, sleeping four hours a night out of necessity, but I've spoken to enough successful people that will even say, if there's something I regret, I regret these years or decades of not enough sleep because of long-term what it may actually do to their health. Um, so for the bodybuilding world, I think there's a lot of people that still kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, they'll brag about I can't sleep or oh, I always get up earlier. People like, I'm getting up in the middle of the night to eat a meal. I'm getting up super early. I can't sleep. So I just decided to get up and do some cardio. And I'm like, that's, I mean, it's, it's, not, like a, it's not a little thing. It's a massive thing. Um, and then I joke too, is that when we're looking at food and supplements and all that, you get some bodybuilders that um, they have no awareness. Like the things that people will say just casually of like, oh, this thing wrecked my stomach or I drink, you know, drank this. And then, you know, immediately people talk about like everything that I would say is kind of a diagnosable digestive issue. And they'll just kind of be like, oh, this is kind of like normal. You know, I'm always bloated. I'm always having these digestive issues. I'm always having whatever. And, um, and you know, people will say like, oh, you know, it's just the way that I am. I just can't sleep or I just do these things. And again, I always say like work comes in different forms. So if like, again, if people say, I just can't sleep, I'll be like, okay, well, what have you, what have you done to improve it? And they'll be like, oh, you know, I just, I try to go to sleep or maybe I've taken some melatonin or I've taken a sleepy time tea. And I'm like, you know, that's like the most general, just like, oh, maybe this will work because this has the word sleep in it. And, um, you know, so I'll talk to people about like, well, what do you do for sleep schedule? What do you do for sleep grooming? You know, and if and the very basic stuff before you actually pay for a professional, of stuff that has been established from medical professionals. I was like, well, you know, you have no screen time like two hours before bed. Are you off your phone for X amount of time before bed? Do you not take calls this amount of time? Like there's certain things that I think of whether it's, I don't need to get too technical, but into blue light exposure and stimulus and things that can lead to stress. But you say that to some people and I'm like, wait, they're like, wait, no, no screen before bed. Like, well, what am I supposed to do? I'm like, yeah. oh, if you can't think of something to do aside from watch TV or look at your phone, Maybe there's some other stuff to reevaluate, but that's literally, I mean, that's not my stuff. I don't sell sleep plans, but if you actually talk to someone that's a medical professional that helps, maybe their whole job is to help people with sleep patterns. There's these things that they'll address before they even remotely get into medication. And then after that point, if maybe you're actually doing those things and you still have issues, then you could actually seek out help from a medical professional and you find out, okay, well, are you having a hard time falling asleep, staying asleep? You get up too early, you get up in the middle of the night. And when you actually work with a professional, they'll figure, oh, here's this thing that's actually mixing and maybe you need a specific supplement or you need a specific thing or maybe in some case someone needs medication um and so again i think um if you're trying to take your physique as far as possible i think people need to tra- take their um their sleep they need to take their nutrition which again there's the old saying which i think is great you're not what you eat you're what you absorb um or you're what you utilize something along those lines um and if people don't take that seriously they'll have all these digestive issues and stuff and i'm like how can you not 
that needs to be just as finely tuned as your logbook. You know, so some people have their logbooks and their whole day revolves around hitting their PRs and doing all this stuff. And I was like, you know, you're going in with one hand tied behind your back. You know, you have all this recovery stuff that could have made these PRs happen easier, made you progress faster from week to week. And so I always say, and again, these aren't any services I provide or take money for, so I'm not promoting anything that I do. But again, if you have sleep issues, you know, are you actually doing the work, which again, some people is putting your phone down. Then again, that's work. People are like, oh, I like to do eight plates and I'm hardcore and I'm strong. I say, well, put your phone down every night for two hours before you go to bed. It's like, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm like, well, that's, that's the definition of work. It's something that you don't want to do that is going to help you get towards a goal. It's not something that you enjoy to do and you're going to get towards a goal or something that you can advertise and show everybody that you're doing and it makes you look better or more hardcore or whatever. So I say that's a big thing competitors could do right now is um, you know, take advantage of if you have anything, if you have anything less than a 10 out of 10 sleep habit, fix it. If you have anything less than 10 out of 10 digestion, fix it. And again, that means most likely if it's not simple stuff, spend money on someone to actually help you figure out what the problem is and fix it. And then my last little thing is, you know, bodybuilders typically are horrible at taking, for lack of a better word, like their prehab. Um, so again, I always joke that barbells go straight from, or excuse me, bodybuilders go straight from having like their max load in their hands, you know, to five plates on something or whatever, straight to somebody else jamming an elbow into their body. Now there's no in between for them. So it's like they literally do these things and they take no, you know, preventative care of what they're capable of doing. And again, I've you've seen some of my stuff. I'm a big advocate of the most simple things people can do is actively taking their body and their joints and their muscles through their full range of motion, whether you do it as part of your training every single day or post-training every single day or as a daily habit. It literally is borderline like miraculous, the changes and things that that will help improve bodies. But most of it is just boring and tedious and it's not pretty and you can't advertise it. Um, and again, that's the thing too, is people like to advertise, oh, I take care of my recovery. I get massage once a week or twice a week or whatever. And, um, and I hate to say it, there's very, very intelligent massage therapists out there. There's very intelligent practitioners and doctors and physical therapists and chiropractors. But if your person just goes and jams something into you hard for an hour, um, once a week or twice a week, that's doing absolutely nothing for recovery. And I would argue it could actually be causing more inflammation and limiting your recovery. Um, because again, if you're trying to change tissue, jamming something into it does not permanently change tissue. And if you're in trying to improve your body's lymphatic system or function, there's actually been research showing that massage decreases depending on how you do it and depending on the individual, but really just hard, aggressive, putting force into a 90 degree angle does not actually help your lymphatic system function any better or does not help decrease inflammation. Um, so those are the things if I was at home and I was a, you know, a professional bodybuilder or trying to make my living out of my physique in some capacity, I would be honest with myself and say, am I given 10 out of 10 work ethic into those things. And, and again, a lot of people, a lot of people aren't, which just amazes me because it's, um, again, it's boring and tedious, but it's low hanging fruit that people just aren't addressing. You're hundred percent right. And I'll hold a hand up and say, I'm not putting 10 out of 10 into mobility work or stretch. Yeah. I think if there was something that was a wake me up, I think a little bit of a push in the right direction from the hypertrophy coach to do that is mm -hmm. something that I'm definitely going to do or start doing after, yeah. after listening to this podcast. So mm -hmm. um, much appreciated for that. Now, yeah. I'm aware of time. I know you're a busy man, but I'm just going to ask you one mm -hmm. quick thing before we go. For sure. Um, I mean, how do you think the industry is going to change? Do you foresee people perhaps training more from home? Do you see any differences in how people train? Or do you think things will sort of resort back to the, the way it was? Or do you feel there'll always be a slight difference? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess, I mean, the, the one thing that'll change, sadly or not sadly, so again, you look at Again, I, I don't, the funny thing now is obviously when you're, the funny thing is people say, oh, we're living through history now. I'm like, well, we're always living through history. Maybe just this is more noteworthy than just, hey, it was a Tuesday and I went and picked up my kids from school. Um, so again, yeah, I don't know how, uh, you know, we'll look back on this, you know, a year from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, what it will be written about in history books and what kind of impact it'll have on society as a whole. But I do kind of think to a certain extent and not nearly as big of a deal. So I don't want to compare it to some things, especially for people that went through this. You know, but you look at how society is like during a wartime and after a wartime and like after when the war is over and everybody comes home, everyone's happy and everyone's great. And it's some of the, you know, the whole world's happy and everyone's, you know, looking at the, you know, the, the grass is greener everywhere and looking at rainbows and hugging everybody. And then sadly, we slowly revert back to the normal after that. So everyone now is talking about like, oh, you know, I can't wait till this and I can't wait to hug people and I can't wait to do this and that. And, um, and I think that's awesome. I mean, why not focus on the positive? And I, there will be a whole bunch of that. So I think it will ignite um, passion in a lot of people and ignite, you know, kind of a refreshed 
oh, this are the things I loved about this and I took this for granted and now I'm back in. Um, but just the, I don't know if it's being pessimistic or realistic. You know, I think, I don't think a whole lot of people that weren't passionate about it or weren't before, weren't doing things different before will come out of here a whole lot different. They might feel that way for a little bit, but people will tend to revert to where they were. <laughs> Um, unfortunately beforehand. So it's, you know, the whole, I've seen people observe it and make the observations like people that used to complain about Mondays. It's like, well, you're not complaining about Mondays now, are you? You, you give anything to have one of your normal Mondays you used to complain about back. Um, I do think there could definitely be a subtle shift because this shift has already been happening as far as home gyms. I mean, and honestly, to give, you have to give a hundred percent, 99% credit to CrossFit, honestly. Um, and again, if there's one great thing Again, I always say CrossFit is a sport, so I don't want to get too much into the specifics of CrossFit. That has nothing to do with just the average person wanting to get healthy or lose some weight. Um, but again, I totally get the idea that it's a sport and people enjoy sports. And the thing you have to give credit to CrossFit is it's probably put a barbell in the hands of more normal people than anything has done in the past hundred years. Yeah. Um, and I see it firsthand, just like walking around my neighborhood and walking around stuff. The amount of people that have garage gyms, most people, especially prior to this, I don't know what the percentages are, but when people have garage gyms, and they have a rack. I mean, that's a thing now. I mean, it used to be people would just have a fucking treadmill sitting in there and they'd have their clothes sitting on it or whatever in the garage. But now, I mean, people have racks. It's very, very common in the garage. And people are doing their wads. I mean, I see it all the time. People are out there doing their burpees. They're doing their clean and jerk. And they're doing all this shit fast. And then they run up and down the street and come back. And again, in and of itself, it's nothing. It's good. I mean, sports, again, just get people moving and have people better than the option of doing nothing. So again, I think, honestly, that was a trend we were starting to have that's happened big time over the past, you know, six, seven years. And I think that will tend to move more in that direction. Because again, a lot of people now are going to like, that didn't have home gyms. Obviously, a lot of people have just bought home gyms. Like, obviously, I'm sure that most people in the past month have bought home gyms more than any other time in human history because oh, they're yeah. sold out. That's never happened before, right? You can't get one now if you want one. Um, so I, I don't know. I think it, um, I, overall, I think everyone will be slightly better coming out of this. Um, and I think, again, the people that are already dedicated and into it and, you know, people, you know, people go up and down, right? I mean, life is seasons and obviously I don't want to speak too much to outside of my, my qualifications or credentials of just helping people put on muscles. I mean, but there's people now that I think because it's, it's their living. I mean, I, I don't know what it's like to be Dexter Jackson and have done a billion shows. Right. So it's like, I have no idea what it's like to him. It's gotta be slightly like ho-hum. I mean, I'm sure some of them obviously were very important. The Olympias are always important doing this, but I can't remember this is that much of a routine of your life. So there's some people that because They've made such a living out of it, you know, where they were when they started and where they were now, you know, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of people in that category that lost some of their passion. And now people just going back in their garage when nobody's looking and just picking up metal and get dirty and, gr you know, grimy and sweaty when nobody's looking. I mean, that's cool. I mean, I think a lot of us can relate to that to a certain extent. Um, and I think it's one of those things where I think hopefully it solidifies or wakes some things up for people as well, too, because that's, that's the joke I've said is like, you know, again, if you didn't hear my little story that I just said in the first place, and that's the Cliff Notes version, and you just see, you know, look at this guy doing this stupid shit with cables and bands, and this guy's all over the fucking place. It's like, you know, you weren't, you weren't with me when I was like intentionally seeking out just like dirty gyms and riding my bike to gyms when nobody was looking. And even like I said, training. I mean, I didn't have a social media for the first 10 years of working as a person training. Um, I love training. I love training by myself. I love doing stuff that's just stupid on paper sometimes for the sake of doing something stupid on paper. Um, you know, so I, I'm personally love training in my garage. And even though I don't have some of the stuff that I think hopefully that helps people is like a, a huge thing that I think is maybe a good place then obviously, but for good for trainers and coaches and everybody kind of hopefully the theme of this to a certain degree is kind of managing the expectations of why you do things. Like people don't take enough time to actually think, why am I doing the things that I do? And I think people should be massively, massively, massively emotionally attached to why they choose to train in the first place. Because again, if you don't have a strong emotional driver, this is for Mrs. Jones, this is to Mr. Olympia. If you don't have an emotional driver, eventually, you know, that's the whole dedication versus motivation. Motivation will fade and then you're just going to quit. Where if you can really keep the focus on what is the emotional, most emotional driver of why I do what I do, then you're going to stick with it forever in whatever capacity. So there should be a massive amount of emotion for that. And there should be zero emotion towards the tools that you use. So that's the funny thing. You gave the example of like a JP going from a dumbbell lateral raise to a different lateral raise on paper. I have a hard time arguing why the cable is not 10 times better than the dumbbell thing. So you give it to somebody like JP that has an, a tremendous amount of passion behind what he does. Obviously is not lacking worth. Like it. Obviously he'll pick up a barbell with any amount of weight on it. But if you, he's unemotionally attached to like, yeah, maybe a dumbbell lateral is more hardcore. I would love to have anybody explain to me how it's better aside from the fact that it's hardcore. 
Um, and then once you show them basically someone, maybe a better tool and they know what better means because they've got all this training experience of the right type of pain, the right type of range of motion, whatever. And, um, and be like, oh, well, I'll just, whatever tools I have hand, I will choose the best tools if I have them or I'll unemotionally choose whatever tools I have at hand. Cause at the same time, I'm not going to my gym now and crying that I don't have cables or crying that I don't have a reverse band hack. I don't go in there and go, Oh God, I don't have my favorite bands and tools. I just go in there. It's like, well, here's what I've got. And I'm very happy to just plan out a workout and do my workout and work my ass off and do my shit. Um, and so I hope, cause there's a whole lot of people. I'll see some people coming through this and be like, Oh, we're going to get back to what bodybuilding was about. And I'm like, well, from an emotional standpoint, cool. Like if your emotion is just about just getting in and working hard and passion for all that kind of stuff. But pump, some people are like, oh, now we're going to get more people doing barbells and getting rid of the stupid fluff shit and whatever. And I was like, well, that's the tool is not ever the issue. It's always the individual. You know, if someone's wanting to avoid working hard and they want to see me doing something with a cable and skip over the posts of doing deadlifts and front squats and all that shit, like, oh, well, look, I just got to do cables and squeeze. They're just latching onto a tool to using it the excuse that they don't actually want to train hard in the first place. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, I think a big thing coming out of this is again, if people would just take a little bit of time again, cause that's, that's the whole thing. If you're passionate about training, you're emotional about, it, you have great reasons to do it. You're going to do it in some capacity, no matter what you have uh, at your disposal. But at the same time too, man, is I just want people just need to relax about the nuts and bolts. I mean, that's the funny part is like, yeah. like it's, you feel like I think when people I've used to have people in front of me like, Hey man, I really want to do this exercise. I know you don't like it. I know it's not your favorite. Enough. It's like, why are you saying that? I don't care. Like, tell me why you want to do that exercise. And as long as you have something to tell me, not because I want to hear it, because I want you to hear you say it to yourself to see, do you actually have a reason for it? Then have at it. That's great. Like, I don't give a shit about any tools. That's the thing where it's people want to fight. They want to, everyone wants to fight about everything. Everyone like kind of our conversation. Is it more about form? Is it about progressive overload? You know, is it, does it have to be a barbell or does it have to be a cable? Is it on this team or that team? And that's just human nature. And I wish people were like, I don't want to argue about that. That's got nothing to do with the results. I mean, I'll just, if you want some information, I'll give it to you. Um, but again, it's about a lot of stuff bigger than that that actually leads to people producing results. So, I think that one of the major points to maybe perhaps wrap up the episode on is that results aren't going to happen in black and white. They're going to happen in the gray area. And I think that yeah. everything that you've said in today's episode certainly backs that up, whether it's to do with difference in individuals, equipment, genetics, et cetera, et cetera. But so many golden nuggets that the listeners will get value from. And a massive thank you from myself and everyone in the UK for everything that you do on a daily basis. But for anyone out there who's went, whoa, I want to know about this guy. I want to hear about him more from him. Whereabouts can they get in touch with you? Um, so I say my, my Instagram is my, my best place. That's where I put the most time and effort into. So it's just hypertrophy coach. You can't spell that. It's hypertrophy coach, all one <laughs> word smashed together. Um, and so that's where I have the most constantly. If, again, if you just want to kind of see some of my stuff, um, I do tons and tons and tons of content, at least, you know, one, maybe two posts a day and obviously tons of free content on whatever. If you're looking to get big arms, big, this big, that from specific to general to principles to whatever, there's going to be 20 different posts on any topic that you look at. Um, and then for anybody that wants to nerd out a little bit deeper, um, I basically have like a, um, a membership site. That's a content site. Um, and the only good or bad about that is how much information is on there. So again, I try to make it for people that want to be told what to do. I mean, there's a program builder, there's a daily workout option where you can say, Hey, I want to train chest. You push a button and you get a full workout where there's a video showing every exercise, all your exercise cues, a whole write up and all that deal. But then it's, I think the people that will enjoy it the most, the people that will really dig into it. So there's, you know, 50 plus something hours of videos on there that are like, you know, breaking into topics that people want to look at. So what's my best split? Should I train the failure? How do I program all that kind of stuff? Um, there's hundreds of Q and A's on there. So it's like literally just like, tons and tons and tons and tons of information um, and I joke my business model is uh, it's transparent I like to make a living feeding my family and stuff um, so again if it's uh, people just like to look and get some free stuff I mean I'm happy to help people on Instagram uh, but my site and app it's cheap as hell I mean it's 10 bucks a month I mean and obviously I would like to have a lot of people say hey that's cheap as hell and so hopefully I have enough people uh, to make a living and feed my family but I, then I say that too I mean if you paid for me one-on-one -on -one for an hour it's not cheap um, and paying for me, you still get access to my brain for 10 bucks a month. If you're just looking to get some more all in the same thread, hopefully, you know, looking at some specifics, looking at some concepts, but all coming into how do you actually make gym decisions? You know, it's kind of all on there um, and it's constantly evolving. I'm trying to, I said that there's so much stuff on that site um, that again, I'm, I'm working on making it more user friendly and more concise, actually more so than putting more stuff on there. Um, and I have a new program that I've had a program out for about two or three months now before all this, uh, where again, I built it kind of around first with the idea of my wife, but then just did it with my best friend where it's kind of geared more towards normal people. 
Um, and it's basically built around garage gym workouts. It's like monthly programming. So every single month you get sent brand new workouts, you know, full videos, write-ups, walkthroughs. There's an exercise library. You know, you get private Facebook group. I do a private coaching call on that one-on-one -on -one every single week with everyone that's involved. And that's called the DILF maker, which I'm pretty sure stands for dads in love with fitness. I was going to ask you, is that the DILF maker? Because I was, I was looking into that and like one of my coaches that works with me said, He's got something called the Dilf maker. I'm asking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, I, I, some, someone's told me there's more than one demeaning to Dilf, but as far as I know, it's just dads <laughs> in love with fitness. And so again, I, I've kind of guilt one because I actually built one. First and foremost, I created the name um, because I, uh, I had my wife. I've been training her for as long as we've been together. And basically, since we've had uh, kids, we've got three kids. And just for their schedule before all this, her training at home is really the only option. So I just started training her home. That's the reason I have a garage gym is I built it for her basically. And so I was training her. And at some point in time, I literally, same thing. I had people asking me like, well, what do you do with your wife? And show a video with her every once in a while. So I'm like, well, I've got this whole program built around, you know, her training and stuff. I'm just going to turn it into something. And so I actually call that's the MILF maker. So that was where that one actually started, which again, also stands for oh, yeah. mothers in love with fitness for sure. But it's built around the ideas for normal people. My wife doesn't give a shit about all this like nerdy muscle shit or whatever. She just wants to feel good, look good and all that kind of stuff. She wants to look like I say, I think 95% of women want to look based on what they tell me. And uh, so the program was started with her built around garage gym workouts, you know, three to four times a week, minimal time, minimal garage gym equipment. And, um, and so again, cause I understand that. And that's the only time we have time for me to ever train her or do her workouts. And so again, I put that on the site and then I said, this eventually will have to be its own program. So I did the guy version first and then next will be an updated girl version or ladies version coming as well soon. So again, geared because obviously again, in general, there's some slight differences for how males and females want to look, but, um, yeah, shameless plug. I tell everybody that's a pretty, it's a pretty nice option now because again, it's a yeah, pretty sweet program. For, yeah, I love that. I clicked on your link on uh, your Instagram. I was just checking, checking things out before the podcast and I saw it and I was like, I'm going to ask him about it. And as you were, as you were starting to, and I was like, yeah, I was waiting to jump in and say, is this a dilf maker? But you, yeah. 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 I yeah. And, I, I, and I got to give it, I have a business partner that helps me with everything from the, the app side, the website side, all that kind of stuff. And the thing I'll say about that program, which is freaking great is um, it's really, really pretty. So again, if there's something that makes a difference, it's so user friendly. Like this one of the few things, again, when I look at my app and stuff, even now I'm like, God, we got to make this more streamlined. <laughs> Um, but that Dilf maker program is so straightforward and so pretty where it's like, you click, here's your workouts, you know, the, the, for this month, here's your bonus workouts. You know, here's, if you got all the exercise library, here's, if you have questions in the help section, it's just very, very straightforward, very easy, yeah. uh, which was the goal for people that don't want to quite, you know, get lost in content for hours, just nerding out. It's just a very straightforward, you know, home gym training program. So, yeah, I, th I think that anyone listening that is out there that perhaps maybe during this lockdown, wants to improve their body, the Dilf Maker would definitely be something for them. And if anyone is not following yourself as a recommendation for me, anyone in the UK or listening abroad, please go do that because you'll get an incredible amount of value. Um, I've been following you for as long as I can remember. The minute that JP started in Cuff Lattle Raises, I was like, who's this guy? You yeah. can do that. And that was yeah. like, you know, three, four, five years ago. So I think massive thank you for everything you do with the bodybuilding scene right over here in the UK. I know that we're eight, eight hours away, 4,000, 5,000 miles away, but yeah, have a massive impact on us over here. Um, and that's Great, that's that's really nice to hear. We're, we're incredibly grateful for. So, anyone listening, whatever you do, whatever you are, for myself and from Georgia in the lockdown, make sure you give it the beans.